Dan Tapiero, you're back. How are you, my friend? Raul, pal. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I mean, great to see you. I, I know we've been trying to do this for a little while, and sorry it's taken some time. Great to be back and chatting, and uh, was really hoping we'd do this in person. I feel like we have such a you know, good rapport in person, but look, this is this is good for now. We will get back there, but we're currently on two different Caribbean islands right now, so it's not the end of the world. Dan, let's update people with what you've been up to, because, you know, as ever, I, I love the way you approach things. You find a macro thesis, then you look at a way of playing out a macro thesis in a kind of non-traditional way, um, and you've done this your whole career. So, Let's just give a bit of backdrop of some of the times you've done this before. We don't have to go into too much detail, but I'd love to hear what you're doing now and why you did it. And then we'll dig into all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's very funny. I, again, as you know, was a portfolio manager in the hedge fund world for 20 plus years. And of course, at all those names at Tiger, at Duquesne, SAC, et cetera, I worked with some of the great guys. Um, and I had the advantage of, really seeing how each of them looked at markets, how each of them processed information, made trades, uh, structured their portfolio. And I think that sort of gave me a very unique um, view. You know, also throw Michael Steinhardt in there in the early days. So, um, and I didn't really have a traditional uh, way of approaching or looking at markets. Again, it was a you know, it came from a combination of experiences. And so that was on the portfolio management side, but I also had a natural bias towards thinking more long-term. And of course, we'd see that, you know, if you sat with some of these macro ideas, macro views, and you you didn't trade or you weren't forced for some you know reason to trade the mark for the week, month or whatever it is, that the returns were, could be astronomical. And so in 06, when I was working with Druck, um, and focused on grains, uh, mostly on grades and agriculture um, at that time, you know, I'd written up the sort of typical 50-page investment memo that, you know, my team and I actually still do, lots of in-depth work on this idea that U.S. farmland prices could double in the coming five years. And we had all our different reasons for expecting, you know, that to happen. Um, and again, the original, in the memo was, um, for the purposes of explaining the position in futures and swaps. And I remember Stan just coming in and saying that, you know, he loved the idea. Was there another way for us to express that bet? And um, again, you know, out came this investment memo about uh, the doubling of price in grains, but also doubling of price in the farmland in specific locations. It was mostly in the Mississippi Delta uh, Nebraska, Illinois, I came up with this sort of 20 item checklist. We hired a, a CEO, we partnered with the Goldman Sachs partners, and we built Agcoa from the ground up. Um, and by 2013, it was the largest private farmland REIT in the US. And we ended up selling it to the Canadian pension fund system, CPP, uh, for 450 million. So um, it was a, an aggregating business in a sense, it was a macro view that I'd come up with that was expressed in a different way, in a unique way, which shocked me. You know, there are a lot of interesting things that shocked me really was only at the time four, um, there were only four other sort of institutional buyers of U.S. farmland um, at the time. And I don't think it's really increased that much. And the total market value, and I can't recall exactly, but the total market value of U.S. farmland was in the hundreds of billions. And so, I mean, high hundreds. And I just thought, how could there only be a handful of institutional buyers? And the answer is because it's hard to do. <laughs> you have to hire a team. You got to kick the dirt. You got to get out and see if, you know, everything pencils, as the farmers say. But that was sort of my first introduction. I really, you know, I give Stan a lot of credit for sort of pushing me in that direction um, because, you know, he has long-term views, but he also has, you know, shorter term views and likes to trade, et cetera. But he really sort of backed my idea and was very supportive. Um, you know, uh, and, and again, we were partners in that business for seven years, um, a, a long time, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of weekly and bi-weekly meetings talking about the different farms, et cetera. You know, I give him a lot of credit for, you know, helping me sort of adapt in a way 
um, and, and learn and adapt and learn how to sort of maximize, um, you know, P&L uh, on a macro idea with a dramatically different risk reward perspective, uh, risk reward um, uh, structure. I mean, how dramatic? I'll tell you, in 2008, our portfolio of farms actually marked up. It was bonds and our portfolio that were the only assets that were up over 2008. And so that made me see something really important, which is that I could get access to something that was extremely volatile, the underlying grain futures, and I could hold through a very volatile uh, yeah, period. Yeah, just so explain, I, on the other hand, had the same thesis, set up a hedge fund with a friend of mine and had to close it down in 2008 because of the volatility of trading the underlying as opposed to the actual farmland. So you had a much superior bet. Yeah, well, yes, in a way. And again, um, we we ended up doing well uh, with the farms. Many of them doubled and tripled in price. And I don't know that necessarily in every type of bet like that, that you're going to, you know, outperform the underlying. I don't really know. I mean, and again, I didn't really care. What I cared was I wanted to get exposure. I didn't want to get liquidated at the bottom by some panicky, you know, investor in, you know, Switzerland or whatever it is. And I, I wanted, and we didn't, you know, we didn't have that many outside investors, but I really wanted to hold the bet. And again, if you looked at what the relative, you know, sharp was, I mean, it's probably, you know, massive difference. I mean, I never looked at it. I didn't really care so much, but um, the fact that it never marked down through 08 was just, you know, incredible to me, right? And then, of course, what happened was we started buying again in early 09, right? We paused a little bit in 08 just to see what was, you know, to make sure that the whole world hadn't completely blown up. And then I'll never forget this. There was an auction in early 09 in the Midwest, and it was a big farm, and they chopped up chopped it up into 50 different pieces. And there were literal bidding wars breaking out for these plots of this one auction. And I remember, you know, sending Stan an email saying, listen, you know, I know liquidity is tight in the traditional world and things have blown up. And it was like February, you know, March 09. But I'm just telling you, there, there are panic bidding wars breaking out on, on, you know, pieces of land. We should get back in into gear, right? And we did. And so, again, starting a business from zero, you also, you know, you have many more different ways to win. It's not just a straight binary bet on whether the thing flashing on your screen goes up or down. Um, you know, it's a productive asset. It yields something. Um, you know, it's true collateral in a sense, farmland. It's, it's not disappearing, uh, you know. So again, if you have the ability to hold something and you believe in it long-term, you have to have it in a structure that allows you to do that. And so in a way, um, you know, I did sort of the same thing again with GBI, you know, Gold Bullion International, my gold business, you know, very bullish on gold and physical gold coming out of 08 or 09. And I wanted a to start, you know, an operating business um, that would give me leverage to the, you know, growth in the gold price over the coming five to 10 years, because I thought after 08 or 09, rates are going to be zero or real rates for a long time. Um, and gold will benefit in some way, but gold is very difficult to trade. And I've been trading it since the 90s. I know you have too. And it's just the kind of thing that it never does what you want it to do. Never. When you want it to do it. And, and silver is 10 times worse. And I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die early, you know, trying to figure out when gold is going to have its, you know, 20, 30% year or whatever it is. Let's just set up an operating business. I want to own physical. I want to own it outside the banking system. Uh, I brought in a co-founder of mine who worked with me on the ag, uh, Raul, who you know, uh, an ex-Goldman Sachs partner. And he and I co-founded you know, this company, and he's still the CEO today, 11 years later. We just had a record year last year. I think we're going to have a record year this year. And again, um, it's sort of starting an operating business from zero also, you know, allows you to pay the long-term capital gains tax instead of, you know, the, the, the income tax from trading and short-term gains. Also, the other thing that you've managed to do in these structures 
is they become positively funding vehicles to express your macro view. Now, it requires work because you have to set up a business, so they're not easy to do. But once you do it and you get it right, they positively fund and then give you the exposure you want. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And, you know, there is sort of a moat around it because it's kind of a pain. You know, I never forget in the in the goal business, uh, you know, we had this idea, like, how do we become the blue chip provider of physical gold, like to the world and especially to sort of the, the wealth management world? And we had this almost silly idea in the time, but we thought, OK, let's get on the Merrill Lynch wealth management platform. You know, there are three uh, three trillion dollars in assets at the time, 16,000 FAs. We'll just plug into their distribution network. No problem. Anyway. We had to build a, a technology, build the platform. It took 18 months of due diligence. And I've said before, you know, proctological examinations from Merrill Lynch. And we went through, nearly failed many times. We had a great team at the time that really made it happen. Um, and, you know, it was, it was difficult and we could have failed. And it might not have been Um, you know, in the first several years, even of that business, we were break even and even in the beginning, losing bits of money. So it's not it's not easy, but we had a long term vision. Uh, We did get on that platform. We became the first new company ever uh, to get onto the Merrill platform. So that was exciting. And all of a sudden now anyone in that in that world, and if you have an FA at Merrill and you want a physical bar and you want it stored in Singapore, that FA just pushes a, a button on a screen and then that's us. You know, we integrated with them and, you know, we we call it the, the Merrill Lynch Precious Metals Platform, but it's it's us. And, and we partnered with Merrill. And we now have, I'd say, 10 to 15 business verticals like that. And so even when gold goes down, OK, and this is the great thing, we're still making money. Um, and even when gold goes sideways, we're still making money. So because we have different business lines that do different things. It's sort of interesting. I don't want to get too much into this, but it's sort of interesting. We have business lines where the buy that the um, the community of that vertical, let's call it, only buys or like let's say likes to buy when the market's going down. We then have other verticals where that community likes to buy only when the price is going up. So you know, it's just worked out that way. I can't say that you know we did it purposely, but it worked out that way. And so you've got a business that is just always running. And as you said, now, you know, is throwing off dividends uh, every quarter and is sitting with a big cash balance and, uh, you know, wonderful EBITDA numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, uh, you know, that's 15 years of sort of experience expressing a macro idea through a business, through a different structure uh, that is unique. And again, I guess that leads us to 10T which is, you know, what I'm doing now. What I love about 10T is we've followed your whole journey from you tapping on the shoulder saying, listen, I've been doing the work. You, you've got to start looking at this again. And then your whole yeah. journey of then setting this whole thing up. So explain to people what you're doing and your idea behind that. And then we'll dig into the portfolio and stuff a bit as well. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, you know, many people, I mean, I still get like once a week, at least or more, I don't know, people saying, you know, that interview you did with Raul in the summer of 19, that got me to take it seriously and this and that. And I'll tell you, that's a great, I'm so happy about that. I, you know, it was sort of, we had been talking for months, of course, about the idea. And I just came on and, you know, we just talked through what we'd already been talking about. Um, And so that was sort of my initial big foray into, into the Bitcoin. And again, you know, the 80-20, or it was, I think, probably 85-15 Bitcoin Ethereum exposure I did at that time, um, which, of course, now is skewed much greater towards uh, uh, Ethereum, as you mentioned before. But, you know, I, I did all the work, fell down the rabbit hole big time at, in, in sort of 18, uh, early 19, and then had the position on. And just like with Agcoa, you know, sitting with the grain position, I started to think, okay, I'm bullish on this space for the next five to 10 years at least, how do I get an exposure where I don't have to sit through 80% drawdowns? Where, you know, we know that that's what's happened. Bitcoin has had seven drawdowns of 80%. Ethereum went down 95%. Uh, You know, it's not pleasant. 
And um, I'm going to have my position. You know, I'm a hodler there and I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to think about it. But the space is growing and there's so many interesting genius type intellectual guys also under the age of 35. I think this is the future. Um, how do I participate in it? Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.